Great. Well, it's so good to be here with you this afternoon. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Um, I'm obviously not from around here. Uh, I moved to Atlanta just a few months ago, and I will admit, I thought I was prepared for the culture shock, um, but nothing could have prepared me for the way in America you guys are so obsessed with pickles. I don't know if you're aware of this. Like in England, we have one type of pickle. And then uh, my first time in an American supermarket, I nearly had a heart attack. I actually took a panoramic photo of the pickle aisle and sent it to my family. And I was like, everything you see from left to right is all pickles. It's really weird. Um, But I will admit your pickles are really good. uh, Someone recommended the Mount Olive bread and butter ones and they're excellent. So thank you for that. But, you know, the weirdness of pickles aside, um, one of the things that hasn't been that surprising about American culture, and that actually has proven to be the same, whether you're in the UK or the United States, is that now more than ever, I think this is a time when Christians really need to learn to be bold. Bold not only in sharing our faith, but actually bold enough to stand firm in a world that no longer just thinks of Christianity as irrelevant or naive, but actually it's branded it as something much worse, as dangerous and even immoral. This is a really big cultural shift. You know, for centuries, Western society, it tried to live up to the morality that we find in God. But these days, rather than looking to the Bible for our moral standards, instead we blame the God of the Bible for our morality. So leading the charge is Richard Dawkins, who, having spent some extensive time with a thesaurus, has this to say about the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Tell us how you really feel, Richard. You know, sadly, this kind of critique against the morality of the Christian God is only getting more intense. In fact, just last year, the atheist Dan Barker wrote a book inspired by Dawkins' quote, which he called the most unpleasant character in all fiction. And amongst other endorsements, this is what some some reviewers have had to say about his book. If you thought Dawkins' The God Delusion was hard on religion, gird your loins for Dan Barker's unrelenting deconstruction of the Bible. You will never read the good book the same way again. Dawkins and Barker have both written books encouraging readers to become atheists. Who knew all they had to do was direct everyone to the Bible? You know, with best-selling books like this on the market, it's hardly a surprise that the reputation of the God of the Bible has sunk very low in popular opinion. Not long ago, I was having a conversation with my cousin Stephanie, who's a lawyer in New Jersey, when she told me she could never become a Christian because the God of the Bible is just too sexist. A few months ago, I was chatting to someone on a plane who, when I told them that I studied the Old Testament, immediately responded, you're kidding You really believe all that fire and brimstone stuff? And yet, as disconcerting as it may feel to us, this type of attack on the God of the Old Testament is nothing new. In fact, it goes as far back as 144 AD to a church leader called Marcion, who taught that the God of the Old Testament was so cruel that he couldn't possibly be the same loving God that we encounter in the New Testament. Now, after a decade of focused study in the Old Testament, I actually couldn't disagree more, but I do feel the force of the objection. Because while at the start of the Bible, we may have this radical declaration that all of humankind is made in God's image, rumor has it that there are certain categories of people that God treats in a morally reprehensible way. And among them are foreigners, slaves, and women. It's rumors like these that cause many to agree with the atheist Christopher Hitchens, who said the Bible may, indeed does, contain a warrant for trafficking in humans, for ethnic cleansing, for slavery, for bride price, and for indiscriminate massacre. But we're not bound by any of it because it was put together by crude, uncultured human mammals. And if we want proof text for Hitchens' view, then we can turn to Deuteronomy 20, verse 16. It says, In the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes. 
or Leviticus 25, verse 44, as for your male and female slaves, whom you may have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. What about Deuteronomy 21, verse 10? When you go to war against your enemies and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands and you take captives, if you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and you're attracted to her, you may take her as your wife. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, as Christians, when we read verses like these, we find ourselves shocked and appalled. How? Can this be the same God that said that every person is created in his image and equal before him? How can this be the same God who is Jesus, the Jesus who commands us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us? How can this be reconciled with the fact that the Apostle Paul calls slaves his brothers and says there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female? The protests of our culture against the morality of God are a crucial challenge for us. Because if we can't trust that God has been good in the past, how can we trust his goodness today or tomorrow? If he commanded his people to treat the Canaanites unjustly, how can we trust that he's going to act with justice towards the gay community or to the Muslim community or to our non-believing family and friends who we hold so dear? The Christian God is supposed to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if we can't trust him with yesterday, how can we trust him with today, let alone forever? And with the rest of our time together, I'm going to take a closer look at how the God of the Bible does treat foreigners, slaves, and women. But before we do that, it's absolutely crucial that we remember when it comes to reading the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, we have to be so careful not to leap to conclusions. This is a lesson that I learned for myself the first time that I went to stay with my in-laws, who are Italian-Americans uh, living in New Jersey. And I found myself sitting out on the deck with my husband's great uncle. He's called Uncle Big. And yes, that really is his name. When I heard raised voices coming from inside the house. And so I turned around and looked through the kitchen windows to see my husband, Vince, and his mom in the middle of what looked like a screaming match. They were both bright red in the face. Their noses were like one inch away from each other and their arms were gesticulating wildly. And what made the whole thing even more terrifying was that my mother-in-law had been chopping garlic with this huge kitchen knife. And so every so often as she was flinging this thing around, when she'd get particularly worked up, she would just kind of point it right in Vince's face. And so I'm watching this and thinking, oh my goodness, World War III has broken out and I'm going to have to run in to the middle of this thing to try and break it up and I'm probably going to get skewered in the process. Now, thankfully, things finally calmed down and Vince walked away. And so I went to find him because I was concerned. And I said, hey, are things okay with your mum? And Vince looked at me, baffled, and he had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. And he reassured me that he and his mum were having just a perfectly enjoyable conversation. And so I said, but what about the loud voices and the hand waving and the knife? And he just laughed and he said, Joe, that's just how Italian-Americans talk to each other. You know, I completely misinterpreted the situation. What looked to me like a knife fight was, in fact, two Italian-Americans just showing that they love one another. And, you know, it shocked me that even as someone who'd grown up watching American TV, who's used to traveling to other countries and who even spoke the same language, well, supposedly anyway, I could still so badly misinterpret another culture. My point is this. If I had that much trouble understanding Italian-Americans living in New Jersey in the 21st century, how much more challenging should I expect to find understanding and interpreting ancient Near Eastern cultures from around 3,000 years ago? You know, when we step into the Old Testament, we're actually stepping into a wildly different world. And so we need to work hard to understand the cultural context of the text that we're reading. But when we do, they make so much more sense. Consider, for example, Dawkins' accusation that through the conquest of Canaan, God showed himself to be a racist, genocidal tyrant, and ethnic cleanser. 
Now, Dawkins accusation, it actually contrasts strongly with the overarching vision of the biblical narrative that although we live in a fallen world now, we look forward to a future when we can live at peace. As the prophet Isaiah says, to a time when swords will be beaten into plowshares and there will be no war. Looking towards that time, God promises Abraham that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And this is how God commands the Israelites to live out that promise. He says, the foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as you love yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Now, of course, It remains true that as a last resort for dealing with the bloody, brutal cultures that surrounded ancient Israel, we do find instructions for warfare in the Old Testament. But I wonder if Richard Dawkins knows that while the standard practice for warfare was to rape captive women, the Israelites were prohibited from this. And while other tribes frequently attacked the Israelites without warning, the Israelites were commanded by God to offer their opponents the chance to surrender. And although in other nations men were forcefully conscripted into the military, in Israel men were excused from fighting if they were recently married, if they just built a house, or simply if they didn't want to. It was also common practice in the ancient Near East to treat conquered victims with absolute ruthlessness and extreme forms of torture. And yet in contrast to this, in Deuteronomy 20, God actually commands the Israelites to leave behind the fruit on the trees and show mercy to the survivors in the land so that they don't starve. In the messy, bloody context of the ancient world, God gave laws for warfare that were intended to protect human life as far as possible. But what then are we to make of the toughest passages? For example, the passage in Deuteronomy 20 that says to kill everything that breathes. Firstly, we need to know that these commands from God are extremely rare in the Old Testament and only given within very specific circumstances with strict stipulations that the Israelites are only to do this against particular peoples and only in the cities that the Lord is handing over. Why does that matter? Because it means that God is not setting a precedent here. By framing these commands in this way, the Bible won't allow us to look back on these texts and use them as justification for similar kinds of warfare, either today or at any point in history. And to do so, as they did during the Crusades, is to violently abuse and misunderstand the original meaning of these texts, as these commands are intentionally limited to a specific time, a specific place, specific people, and for a very specific purpose. The second thing to say is this, although at first these commands may appear extremely black and white, the picture that the Bible actually presents of what takes place is more complex than you might initially assume on a sweeping reading of the text. And in particular, the rumors surrounding the complete destruction and slaughter of the Canaanites turn out to be just that, rumors. For example, initially we're told in Judges chapter 10 that Joshua has fulfilled God's commandment to kill everything that breathes in a particular region. And yet only a few chapters later, the Israelites go on to fight with still more people living in that very same region, the region where Joshua has supposedly already killed everything that breathes. Other texts confirm the reality of the Israelite victory being less comprehensive than we might initially assume, as despite the claims to have destroyed everyone, Judges 1 verse 27 clearly states that the Israelites did not drive them out completely. And actually, even the language that's used here, this language of driving out, is further evidence that in actual fact, the fate of many of the Canaanites was exile rather than death. I know when I first heard rumors of these supposedly indefensible passages in the Old Testament, what upset me the most was all the civilians that must have been killed. However, archaeological evidence also indicates that the cities that the Lord handed over to the Israelites were not major civilian cities, but actually military outposts along trade routes where there would have been very few non-combatants. So Jericho, for example, was actually a small fort manned by soldiers, which makes sense of how they're able to march around it seven times in one day because it's small enough. 
And the only civilians we're told are present are Rahab and her household. And she's not only saved, but actually becomes part of the bloodline that leads to Christ and is counted in the book of Hebrews as a woman of great faith. Consequently, what many scholars now suggest is that this instruction to kill everything that breathes, to wipe everyone out, is actually a military idiom. It's military language. It's kind of similar to the way that, as someone who has married an avid New York Yankees fan, I might say the Yankees slaughtered the Red Sox in that game. It was total carnage. Now, I mean that as a true statement, and yet, I don't literally mean that the Yankees are going to be thrown in jail for first-degree murder of the Red Sox. It's a common expression we use. It's an example of the way we use exaggerated language in everyday speech. Using a similar kind of warfare language, the Egyptian pharaoh, Ramesses II, appears to claim that he wiped out the whole nation of Israel in the 13th century BC. As he says, Israel is wasted, his seed is no more. Yet obviously we know that Israel was not wasted. The people weren't fully wiped out. Instead, it's an example of this kind of military language that was well known and understood in ancient culture. Adding up these various pieces of both archaeological and textual evidence, what biblical scholars conclude is that while the Israelite victory may have been decisive against the Canaanites, it was not a war of total annihilation. Now, of course, none of this takes away from the fact that God did command the Israelites to go to war against these people. And nor is there any getting around the fact that actually warfare is always horrendous. And yet, according to the Bible, this was a justified war, a war that God intended as an act of justice. For many people, the severity of the judgment of the Canaan through warfare, it may seem disproportionate. We might struggle to see the justice in it. But perhaps this is because we can't fully comprehend just how deplorable Canaanite society had become. It was a culture known for bestiality, for incest, and for adultery. A culture that prostituted their own children and who consistently assaulted the Israelites and preyed on their most vulnerable. The idol that they worshipped was Anat, the goddess of sex and war, who's described in Canaanite mythology as wading in blood so deep that it came up to her neck. Under her feet were human heads. Above her, human hands flew like locusts. Her liver swelled with laughter. Her heart was full of joy. This is a people so depraved that as part of their worship, they sacrificed their own children in the fire to the god Molech. And archaeologists have found the child remains of thousands of child sacrifices in the Phoenician city of Carthage who worshipped those very same Canaanite gods. During my conversation with the agnostic stranger on the plane, he brought up the atrocities that Islamic State have been committing in Syria. And then to my surprise, he said this, I suppose when it comes to justice, I'm a bit Old Testament. Sometimes our society can be so wishy-washy, but we have to open our eyes to the fact that evil is real. And what he said reminded me of the Yale theologian Miroslav Wolf, who wrote after the massacre of his people in Yugoslavia, and this is what he says. My last resistance to the idea of God's anger was a casualty of the war in former Yugoslavia. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination, and I could not imagine God not being angry." How did God react to the carnage by refusing to condemn the bloodbath, but instead affirming the perpetrator's basic goodness? Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Although I used to complain against the indecency of God's wrath, I came to realize that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. You know, if God didn't judge the perpetrators of evil, then we would have to wonder whether he actually cares about the victims of evil. Because when you love someone, you just cannot stand by and see them hurt and do nothing. 
And it's because of the love God has, not only for the Israelites, but for every one of those sacrificed children that the Canaanites had to be judged. And yet, even to the Canaanites, God remains slow to anger and abounding in love. This is the God who the Old Testament tells us holds off judgment for 400 years in the hopes that the Canaanites would turn and be saved. Just as this is the God who ultimately was willing to be judged himself so that he could hold off judgment, not just for 400 years, but for all eternity at the cross. The Canaanite goddess Anat glories in shedding the blood of her enemies. The Christian God had his blood shed while praying for his enemies. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Our God is nothing like a genocidal tyrant. But what are we to make of his attitude towards slavery? Slavery was the foundation upon which the empires of the ancient world were built. Aristotle, who lived in what was supposedly the most advanced civilization of the ancient world, had this to say about slavery. He says, tame animals are naturally better than wild animals. By analogy, the same must necessarily apply to mankind as a whole. It's clear that there are certain people who are free and certain who are slaves by nature, and it's both to their advantage and just for them to be slaves. For Aristotle, all people are not created equal. Slaves are not equal. And who would have been slaves? Primarily the poor. But what the Bible actually affirms is the exact opposite of this. No person is inferior by nature. And it's actually in an effort to care for the poor rather than to take advantage of the poor that certain forms of slavery are sometimes allowed. In ancient Israel, the poor were given the right to glean the edges of the fields at harvest time, and their fellow Israelites were prohibited from charging them interest on their loans. However, if after all of this, an individual or family still found themselves destitute, then as a last resort, they had the option of choosing to work as servants to pay off their debts. So Leviticus says they're to be treated as workers hired from year to year. You you must see to it that those to whom they owe service do not rule over them ruthlessly. And importantly, this was not slavery as we tend to think of it. Rather, it's actually a form of voluntary indentured servitude, and nor was it a permanent position. As every seven years, the debt was cancelled, and these servants were released, regardless of whether they'd fully paid off their debt or not. And if they hadn't, the employers just had to swallow it. And when this happened, their employers were commanded even to give generously to them and to do so without a grudging heart. Significantly, even foreign slaves had the opportunity to save up sufficient means to buy back their freedom and remain as residents in the land. On top of this, the Israelites were forbidden from branding or tattooing their servants as if they were property. If they permanently injured their servants, then the servants had to be immediately set free. And if they killed one of their servants, then that was considered murder, punishable by death. All of this stands radically in contrast with the abusive treatment of slaves as property in every other ancient Near Eastern culture. The Anchor Bible Dictionary summarizes that we have in the Bible the first appeal in world literature to treat slaves as human beings for their own sake and not just in the interests of their masters. Or the same conclusion in the words of Job. If I've denied justice to my men servants and maidservants when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? Yes, he did. And this is the same God who in the New Testament continues to value those in slavery, affirming them as our brothers and sisters and proclaiming there's no longer slave nor free. Why? Because Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to ransom us, to buy us out of slavery and into freedom. And Jesus brought us out of slavery to sin with his body. And actually after he ascended, his body, the church, continued to do the same culturally. The early church began to actively purchase and care for slaves as early as the second century. And by God's grace, they were so successful that by the end of the first few centuries, slavery had all but vanished from the Roman Empire. Taking the Bible more seriously shows that the Christian God loves foreigners like no other God ever had. 
and he loves slaves like no other God ever had. And this isn't actually just a historical point, but this is a present crisis that calls for a bold response from Christians today. You know, this year, over 800,000 women will be trafficked across international borders into sexual slavery. And the average age of those who are trafficked is 12 to 14 years old. In my friend Naomi Zacharias's book, The Scent of Water, Naomi recounts some of her experiences helping bring women out of sexual slavery, and she describes it this way. The first time I saw Amsterdam's world-famous red light district, I found myself unable to articulate sentences for the next several days. 400 windows line the streets, each with a red light overhead and a woman behind it for sale. The women were arranged like products in a store, each nationality on a particular aisle, as it were. It was all supposed to represent freedom, so why was it that as a woman I felt anything but liberated? I saw the large tattoo on an upper arm, another on the left hip of a girl in a few windows down. They were the symbols of her pimp, a type of branding to signify that she was owned. I walked into a brothel and met Annie. She looked at me intensely and said, you tell me, if I were to walk into your church today, would they see me as a woman or would they see me as a prostitute? You know, we need to be able to tell Annie that we would see her as a woman, that we would see her as sacred and beautiful. But can we confidently say that when we follow a God who's consistently rumored to be a misogynist, to be sexist, to hate women? Last summer in the UK, our most popular radio station ran a five-week series entitled The Misogynist Book Club, in which every week they discussed a different book that they considered to have been significantly negative and oppressive towards women throughout history. Now, coming in at number two on this list was Fifty Shades of Grey. But guess which book beat out Fifty Shades of Grey to be the number one most oppressive book in the history of the world towards women? The Bible. Yep, the Bible. And yet, very tellingly, in this radio show, the discussion began with Genesis chapter 2, skipping over the stunning declaration in Genesis 1 that men and women alike are made in the image of God and therefore have equal standing before him. You know, it can be easy to overlook how radical these words are from our 21st century perspective, but truly, there's no other statement of gender equality like them in the ancient world. Certainly to Greek culture, this was total nonsense. Plato said it's only males who are created directly by the gods and given souls. Those who live rightly return to the stars, but those who are cowards may with reason be supposed to have changed into the nature of women in the second generation. According to Plato, the punishment for cowardly men is that their souls will be reborn in women. So gentlemen in the room, you have been warned. But you know, just with slaves and foreigners, when the Bible is considered not superficially, but with all of its richness, we find nothing but good news for women. In fact, one of the things I find most amazing is that the texts that are supposedly the most oppressive towards women are in actual fact the ones that I wind up finding most encouraging towards me as a woman. Look at the verse that I began with. If you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and you're attracted to her, you may take her as your wife. After she's lived in your house and mourned her father and mother for a full month, then you may go to her and be her husband and she shall be your wife. If you're not pleased with her, let her go wherever she wishes. You must not sell her or treat her as a slave since you have dishonored her. Now at first glance, this text really does make for uncomfortable reading. But what is it actually saying? Well, firstly, that unlike in the surrounding cultures in which women were considered spoils of war, rape is banned in ancient Israel. Instead, if a man desires a foreign woman, then he has to wait for a full month after the battle, both to ensure that he's not driven simply by short-term battle lust, but also to allow the woman to grieve her parents and her former life. And note that by only mentioning her parents, the text actually disqualifies a woman who's either already married or who's grieving the loss of a husband. After a period of time, the man may then take her, but only if he commits to marrying her. 
And in this way, the woman is welcomed into the Israelite community as a full family member. And finally, if he doesn't want her, then he cannot sell her on like property. Instead, he must set her free. In 2014, I was horrified to read in the news a pamphlet that Islamic State released to its soldiers, giving them guidelines for the treatment of female prisoners of war. Now, the irony of this pamphlet is that the leaders composed it because they were trying to restrain the way that their soldiers were behaving towards the Yazidi and Christian women that they'd taken captive. And yet, amongst other things, this pamphlet states, in accordance with the Quran, that it's permissible for soldiers to have sexual intercourse with female captives immediately upon capture, that she need not be taken as a wife, but only as a sexual slave, that it's permissible to sell her on or give her as a gift if the man doesn't want her. And most horrifyingly of all, that intercourse is permitted even if she's not yet reached puberty. You know, it was as I sat there reading that pamphlet, and to be honest, crying my eyes out, that I was struck by just how unbelievably compassionate these words in Deuteronomy 21 actually are. You know, the two perspectives couldn't be more different. One is a clear case of a horrendous abuse of power, whereas actually the God of the Bible affords women every measure of protection possible in a hostile and broken world. And this is as true in the New Testament as it is in the Old. If you can believe it, by Jesus' day, the treatment of women had actually become worse, not better. So low was the view of women at this time that it was common practice among the men of Jesus' era to pray this prayer. Praise be to God that he's not created me a Gentile. Praise be to God that he's not created me a woman. And praise be to God that he's not created me an ignorant man. I guess we can feel good that we came in above the ignorant men. And yet, in a hostile climate such as this, Jesus' own treatment of women is only seen to be all the more outstanding. I have a goddaughter called Mia, and when Mia was three years old and in the middle of her Disney princess phase, she told her dad that her mum was a queen and that Mia was a princess, to which her dad immediately replied, does that make me king then? And my three-year-old goddaughter, who I just adore, instantly responded, don't be silly, daddy. Jesus is king, you're just a boy. (laughs) I was so proud of her. Three years old. And not only does she have excellent theology, but she's already skilled at deflating the male ego in about three seconds flat. (laughs) You know, back to my point, there is a point. Jesus never tells me that I'm just a girl. Jesus never tells me that I'm just a girl. In fact, in Jesus, we encounter a God who dramatically breaks down the limits imposed on women by ancient culture. For example, the influence of Greek culture had led to the belief that women succumbed far more easily to sexual temptation than men. And therefore, if you caught sight of a beautiful woman, then then you would find yourself in grave danger. One Jewish law code even states, it's more dangerous to walk behind a woman than it is to walk behind a lion. And in that culture, if a man was sexually immoral with a woman, then it wasn't the man who was blamed for stumbling, but it was the woman for her powers of beauty and seduction. And yet, into this culture, Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount, in which he completely overturns these cultural assumptions when he says this, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, any man who heard Jesus say this would have fallen off his seat because he's saying the total opposite of what his culture taught, refusing to exclusively blame women. He actually challenges men to see when lust originates in their own hearts, to take responsibility for it and not to treat women as sex objects, but as people who are created equally in the image of God. Likewise, Jesus lived at a time when the education of women was so strongly discouraged that Jewish legislation stated if a man gives his daughter a knowledge of the law, it's as though he taught her lechery. It's as though he taught her wrongdoing. And yet time and again throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus totally disregarding this cultural norm to the point of having long theological conversations with an adulterous Samaritan woman at a well, when even Jesus' disciples comment that they're surprised to find him talking to a woman. But that doesn't hold Jesus back. 
And likewise, when Martha summons her sister Mary away from where Jesus is teaching in their home and back into the kitchen to help prepare food, Jesus actually prevents Mary from leaving. And instead, he says that Mary has chosen what's better and that it won't be taken away from her. The text even describes Mary as sitting at Jesus' feet, which is a well-known symbolic statement for that time, as whoever sat at the feet of a rabbi was counted among his closest disciples. Jesus' response here is shocking. In a context where women were seen as inferior intellectually and confined to domestic duties, he recognizes Mary's intelligence and her spiritual curiosity, and he gives her a place of honor, sitting and learning alongside the men. And remarkably, Jesus even chooses women to be the first witnesses to his resurrection, to the most significant historical event of all time, at a time when the testimony of women was considered so unreliable that it wasn't even considered valid in a Jewish court of law. And yet, Jesus is willing to allow the credibility of his own resurrection, which is kind of a big deal, to rest upon their testimony. Time and again throughout the Gospels, Jesus Christ goes up against culturally oppressive attitudes towards women, and he completely smashes them. The Christian apologist Dorothy L. Sayers says it this way, perhaps it's no wonder that women were first at the cradle and last at the cross. Women had never known a man like this man. There's never been such another a prophet and teacher who took their questions and arguments seriously, who never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female. Both in his teaching and in his activities, Jesus reached out to women as persons who were equally worthy as men in his saving activity. I find it really sad that my cousin Stephanie has been pushed away from Jesus by a completely unfounded rumor that the Bible is against women. For me as a woman, I've never known a man who's more for me than Jesus. Truly, this is exactly the kind of man that I want to spend time with and exactly the kind of God that I long to worship. You know, another woman in the Bible who felt this way was Hagar, who we read about in Genesis 16. By ancient standards, Hagar is a nobody. She's female, she's a slave, she's a foreigner, she's the mistress of a married man, and she's pregnant with an illegitimate child. It literally doesn't get any worse than that. By every measure of ancient society, Hagar is counted as worthless. And yet when Hagar flees from Sarah and Abraham into the desert, something completely unexpected happens to her. You know, it's pretty rare in the Old Testament for anyone to experience a supernatural encounter with a divine messenger from God. And yet the very first time that it happens in the Bible, it happens to Hagar of all people at the very lowest point of her life. When Hagar's lost all hope, God reaches out to her in a deeply personal way. And in response, Hagar gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I've now seen the one who sees me. Among the Zulu tribes in South Africa, they have a particular way of greeting each other. Or instead of saying hello, one person will say, I see you. And the other person will respond, I am here. See, I think the Zulu have come to understand a profound truth, which is that when you look someone in the eye, you acknowledge them as someone who is worthy of your attention and your respect. You say, I see your worth. I see your dignity. I see your humanity. And this is the kind of seeing that Hagar experiences when she encounters God, when the living God looks on her with love, and he doesn't see a foreign enslaved woman but he sees his child, which actually answers the question that Annie asked of Naomi back in that brothel, because the God of the Bible is a God who sees her too. We live in an age where around every corner, there are stories and rumors and accusations of God's oppression, of his hatefulness, of his immorality and his unfaithfulness. They say God has been unfaithful to women, God has been unfaithful to slaves. God has been unfaithful to foreigners, unfaithful to the hurting, and unfaithful to those who are on the margins of society. And you know, these rumors of God's unfaithfulness, they seek to ruin our faith. Because if we can't trust that God has been faithful, we won't trust that he will be faithful. If he hasn't been good yesterday, how can we put our hope in him today or forever? But today, I just want to say clearly and without qualification that these rumors are not true. 
even the three supposedly most difficult cases, foreigners, slaves, and women. It's not just in these situations that the rumors have been exaggerated, but they're a complete inversion of reality and of the heart of God. And if we're bold enough to believe in the God of the Old and New Testament, if we believe in him strongly enough to actually treat his word with care, then we find radical love to the foreigner, to the slave, to women, to men. The Christian God is not a God to be ashamed of, but a God who is utterly worthy of our confident faith and our bold witness. But I guess here's the question for every one of us. Have we bought into the rumors? Have we at times been quicker to doubt God than to doubt the rumors about God? Have we let them chip away at our faith when we should have responded, I know my God better than that? Have we taken God's word seriously enough to know our God better than the rumors about him? Who's enslaved in your life? Is it you? Is it a loved one who's suffering or fighting an addiction? Who's the foreigner in your life? Is it an unbelieving friend who opposes your faith at every turn? Or maybe it's an unbelieving family member who's still a foreigner to Christ. Or today, maybe it's you. Maybe you're sitting here feeling like, I'm a foreigner. This God you're talking about is a stranger to me. I don't know him. The way you've described him, I don't know a God like that. Maybe today you're thinking, actually, if that's really what he's like, if he's really for me, if he's a God who sees me and who looks on me with love, that is a God I would want to know. And if that's how you're feeling today, if that's where you're at, then I just encourage you, don't waste the opportunity of today. Today could be that day where he's not a foreigner to you anymore. And I know that Abdu and Sean and and myself, we'd love to chat with you further if that's where you're at and you want to talk about it after the sessions. Who's the foreigner? And who's the person who, because of gender or any other reason, they feel second rate? Why can you have confidence in God when it comes to your loved ones? And why can you trust him for yourself? Because the rumors aren't true. God has been faithful yesterday. The Bible is a history of God's faithfulness. And if God has been faithful yesterday, faithful to foreigners, faithful to slaves, faithful to women, faithful to every single person, then if there's one thing you can count on, it's that he will be faithful today and he'll be faithful forever. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Joe. Tremendous. We have about 15 minutes to take some questions before we do some breakout sessions. So if anybody has a specific question related to Joe, her talk, we'd like to entertain that now. So who has a question for Joe? Here's a mic behind you. Check one, two. Okay. Hi, Joe. My name is Edna. Um, I like how you spoke on um, foreigners, women, and slavery, because obviously those are really big topics right now that's um, happening in the United States. Um, Lately, um, especially with a foreigner, it's close to heart because my parents are um, legal immigrants, and um, there was an incident that happened where my uncle came over to the house, and my, my dad and my uncle, they're both strong men, you know, followers of Christ. And my uncle, he really was big on, you know, being active and um, going out and protesting and making his voice heard, whereas my dad, he's more passive, you know. So I saw them talk and was listening to a conversation, and as a follower of Christ, my biggest question is, how do we know um, that we are approaching this situation in the most appealing way uh, as, a, as a Christian, you know, should we be aggressive about it? Should we be passive like my father? Um, so that's something that's, you know, with whatever's happening here in the States, you know, that's something that I've been kind of struggling myself with. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Um, it's a really important question and it's a really timely one. And um, I feel like I have to tread carefully this one with this one because I'm not an American, and I've just walked, you know, I arrived here four months ago, and wow, is it an interesting time to move to America. Um, But there are a lot of political sensitivities around it that, to be honest with you, as a foreigner, I'm still trying to get my head around how it works over here. So forgive me if I sound ignorant or like I don't know what I'm talking about on this cultural issue. But um, I think... I think the challenge for us as Christians, like you're saying, is, is, is to what level do we respond, right? So 
I'm not in the position of the government to say what's right or wrong on this issue. I understand the role of government is to ensure the safety of a nation, first and foremost, and the safety of its people. But I do think that as Christians, there's, a, there's another question that we need to be asking, which is what is our responsibility as Christians and what is our responsibility to the kingdom of God? And what do we see of God and his nature and how he would respond to the foreigner and to those who are in need? And I think that then in that situation, it's easier for us because I think we have a call to love our neighbor. And so I don't know, to be honest with you, I don't know what the right response is. You know, the Bible also talks about respecting your authorities and your governments, you know, um, so we need to weigh these things up. We need to be careful in the way we approach them. But certainly I think we should all be thinking, what can I do that's a response of love? And it may look different for every single one of us. Some of you may think I'm called to protest. Some of you may think, no, that's absolutely not what I'm called to do, but I am called to love my neighbor. And so maybe it's worth thinking, how can you love the refugee? How can you love the person who, who is in your neighborhood, who has come into this country, who, who is um, being treated as outcast or being treated as marginalized? I think in one way or another, there are all ways we can serve. Or maybe it's not that they're on your doorstep, but it might be worth thinking, well, how can I go to them? How can I go, you know, uh, today, the question of who is my neighbor, um, which is a question Jesus was asked, has become kind of reframed for us because we live in a global world where actually it's really not that hard to go anywhere. So what does it mean for us to love our neighbor? What does it mean for us to go to the nations? Um, if, you're, if, you know, it may not be, I don't know the situation in Oklahoma, that people are on your doorstep here, but there's certainly a need over there. So what you, can you do? One of my best friends just been serving in one of the refugee camps in Lesbos, uh, which is one of the Greek islands. And um, she said the horrors that she's seen there are just unbelievable, the things that people are doing to each other, what's taking place in those camps, but also the opportunities to, sh to share the love of Christ both practically and, and to talk about him are tremendous. So it's just worth thinking, what can you do to love your neighbor in this political climate? Um, I will say that one of the remarkable things about our generation is actually more people are turning from Islam to Christianity than in any other period in history. And in part because then it's no longer the case that we have to go to them, but they're actually landing on our doorsteps. They're coming to us. And we have the opportunity to tell Muslims who otherwise wouldn't hear about Jesus the truth of who he is. So I don't think fear should ever rule us as Christians. I think the message of the gospel is that perfect love casts out fear. And so I think our response always needs to be one, not primarily of fear, but how can I love and who can I love? And who's, who is the person in front of me? Or if they're not in front of me, how can I go to them? Um, and I come from a church in England that... Um, has seen so many asylum seekers come to Jesus, some of them through the witness of the church. Others have had the most unbelievable dreams where someone appears to them and it's Jesus and he's introducing himself. And uh, we actually have a group of um, over 90 Farsi speakers who are all asylum seekers running from terrible situations in their own countries. But, but now, thank God, are part of the kingdom of God. So I've definitely seen firsthand the opportunities that are. I'm sorry, I know that doesn't answer your question. Should we protest? Should we be passive? I actually think that's one you have to way up for yourself. It's a matter of conscience. Um, and I, I, this isn't a comment on how your government is responding because they're in a different situation, but I'm answering this first and foremost from what's the response of a Christian? How do we respond to those in need? And, and what can we doing? To, what can we be doing to love? So I think that's, I love, one of my friends has a saying, love always takes an initiative. So what initiative can you take? If this is something on your heart, if this is really bothering you and hurting you, what, what opportunity do you have to do something about it? Obviously, you can pray. That's the first one. But is there something more that you want to do as well? Thank you for your question. So uh, I know you addressed... Sorry, I'm right here in the middle. <laughs> I guess I'm standing up. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, I know you addressed the issue a lot on the Old Testament about what the Old Testament has to say about women. But a lot of people like to bring up what Paul says in his writings... Mm. Um, on positions of women in leadership. And I know that, like, historical context, like, the fact that he even mentions women is radical, and the fact that Phoebe is a deacon of his church is really cool, but I didn't know, like, what you'd like to expand on kind of the New Testament uh, view of women as well, too, because some people use that as a way to oppress women as well. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> to do a good job with that one, we need quite a bit of time, um, but... Uh, let me just give you a few brief thoughts. I think Paul gets a bad rap, to be honest with you. I think um, there are a lot of things that the Apostle Paul says that are absolutely incredible, that are completely overlooked by our culture. Because again, we're reading them through 21st century lenses, and we immediately take offense and we miss the point. So for example, Paul's teaching on marriage 
is completely radical. I mean, the idea that not only would a wife's body belong to her husband, but that a husband's body would belong to his wife, that's just unheard of in that culture. And, and, and again, that, you know, when people were listening to Paul there, they wouldn't be thinking, oh my goodness, he's saying women belong to men. They'd be thinking, what? He's saying there's this kind of mutuality in marriage? Are you kidding? Particularly in a culture where often the women were uneducated, often they were marrying men who were a lot older than them, and yet he's saying there's this equality within marriage. It's quite incredible. Again, Ephesians 5, people go to Ephesians 5 and they say, oh, it's saying to submit you know, that, that is a very politically incorrect word in our culture. But again, I think we miss the point when we just focus on that first section of the passage and we miss Paul's radical challenge to men in that culture saying, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. I mean, when I look at the, the challenge of those two callings, the wife to her husband and the husband to her wife, I think, gosh, maybe the men actually have that harder. Um, you know, and I think, I think part of our struggle is that we, we look at that text and then we imagine it in a situation outside of a Christian marriage. Now, the vision for, for marriage that Paul lays forth doesn't work unless it's a marriage under God, right? I'm not going to, I wouldn't want to submit to a husband who I know didn't love God and put him first because then I'm just submitting to his own control, his own whim, his own, you know, whatever. Whereas actually um, to have a husband who loves Christ and puts him first means there's an absolute security in saying, I want to honor my husband. I want to respect him. I want to submit to him because I know that the decisions he makes are under the headship of Christ and they're for me and they're out of love for me. And, And I think it's important to note as well that that whole passage is framed by submit. Um, to one another out of reverence for Christ. So I think it really is set in that context of, of this kind of laying down of life, going both ways. Um, so that's what I'd say on marriage. Um, in terms of uh, ministry and leadership, um, obviously there's a lot of debate about this within the church, depending on which denomination you're in. People have different views. Depending on which country you're in, people have different views, pretty different in Europe. Um, my family has always been split on this, so I'm very sympathetic to pretty much every side. Um, my, my mom doesn't um, think women should be in leadership, but she thinks they can teach. My brother thinks women shouldn't do anything, but he loves me so much that whenever I speak, he'll come along and listen. Um, my dad is a pastor and thinks women should lead churches and preach, and um, this is my job. So you can see there's, quite, there's kind of the full range going on, even within my family. So I spend a lot of time wrestling with these texts. I think what I would say is, um, when Paul is just addressing the churches, without dealing with this specific pastoral situation, um, you do see acknowledgement of women in all sorts of leadership positions. Romans 16 is an obvious place to go. You see people recognized as, um, as deacons, as, um, as fellow workers with Paul. He even calls Junior outstanding among the apostles. There's been a lot of debate over that for a long time. A scholars actually changed the Bible so that it read Junias rather than Junior because they thought it can't possibly be a female. We've got to change the name. Um, actually, there's no record of that being a male name at that time in that culture. It doesn't become a, a male name until about 200 years after, whereas there are lots of records of it being a female name. Some New Testament scholars have said it's Joanna, one of the disciples, that's who it's referencing. Um, So you do see recognition of women in these general pastoral roles when Paul is just talking to them. The challenge is really in 1 Timothy 2, that's the main text people struggle with. Um, A lot could be said about that. The way I understand that, after a lot of reading, others may disagree with me, so I would encourage you to go and do your own reading, do your own research. Don't take my word for it. We talk about it in community, read commentaries, listen to the Holy Spirit, wrestle with these texts. Um, but, but I actually think that's, that's really talking about in the context of marriage. I think the way um, male and female are referred to there is really talking about husband and wife. Um, I think there's good reason to argue that on the basis of um, the language. Um, I also think that it's very much set in the context of false teaching. There's false teaching going on in Ephesus within that church. I think the women, as Paul says, they're clearly uneducated because he tells them to, be, to learn, <laughs> to be quiet so that they can actually learn. Um, and so I think these women are being misleading in what they're teaching. And I think um, this text is coming against that and saying, actually, you need to be silent so that you can know what you're talking about. And I won't allow you to... Um, to kind of domineer your husbands and and take leadership over them or tell them what to do when you're getting it so wrong. And I think, um, you know, some will argue against that because they'll say, well, look at Genesis, look at what's going on. And, you know, Paul goes back to Genesis, so it must be a creation ordinance. But I would also say, look at Genesis. What is that an example of? It's an example of the first time false teaching. A woman doesn't get something right, passes it on, and there's disaster. And so I think Paul may be drawing parallels. That's just a short short analysis of a difficult passage. There's a lot more that could be said. I'd be happy to talk to anyone about it more later. Um, And um, I think we just need to have humility towards each other on this one. I think it's a difficult one. I think it's very easy to brand people as 
um, aggressive feminists on one side if they take one view, or on the other side to say um, you're misogynist. But I, I don't think either perspective comes out of those things. I think Christians just really trying to be faithful to what Scripture says um, and, and take it very seriously. And um, we need to love one another through that, even when we see it differently.